And uh, the speaker is Kurt Johansson. And uh, we are very happy he will give a, a lecture today for two lectures. The first lecture will be slightly longer, but we will still have the break of 15 minutes. That's, that's probably Could be, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. So thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and thanks a lot for the invitation to give this talk here. So, so this will be about edge fluctuations of, of limit shape. So let me first give a very sort of broad picture of what I mean by this. So you can imagine that we, had, we have some kind of stochastic microscopic model, so things in some statistical mechanical model. And in, in looking at a large version of this, we get in some limit, we get some macroscopic shape which is typically would be a deterministic shape. So here we have some randomness, but in, in some large scale limit, we, we, we see a macroscopic shape. But you could zoom in on this macroscopic shape at some sort of intermediate level and see fluctuations around this, this limit shape. And it turns out that in many cases, these fluctuations are universal, although the microscopic model itself can have different structure and the shape can vary. So let me, the very simplest example of this sort of which illustrates this idea is that you take, say, just the central limit theorem. So take some, some non-negative random variables. Just think of this as some distances or time intervals. And then you add them up. So you get this sequence of points, S1, S2, S3, and so on. And if, if you end up add up capital N of them, you reach the last position here, sort of at the nth one, which you can think of as the edge. That. So you have some, some distance there up to this point Sn. So then by the law of large numbers, if these are identically distributed random variables, if you divide by N, this converges to some deterministic number then. And so this would be sort of the limit shape. And this, since it depends on the distribution of x1, this is, of course, non-universal. Changing x1 would give me a different limit. Right? On the other hand, if I rescale around this edge, so, I, I, so the edge now is this n times this average, right? I rescale by the standard square root of n normalization and divide by the standard deviation. We know by the central limit theorem that this always converges to a normal distribution. Right? So here, all the parameters in the model are gone, and this would be true for, for large classes of choices of the random variable. Right? So this is what I mean by universal. We have no dependence on the details here of the distribution. The microscopic picture, as I said, is also non-universal. I mean, the microscopic picture would sort of be looking at the whole point process here, zooming in at the point process around the edge or something like that. This will, of course, also depend on the details of the model. So there is a contrast here between non-universal and universal features. So, so what I want to talk about is this sort of phenomenon in a certain class of models, which are these random tiling models. So you can see immediately in the picture that there is some kind of limit shape here. So this is a certain region called the Aztec diamond, which is tiled by dominoes. So there is a very clear pattern here that you get some kind of limit shape here, which you can imagine would be a circle in the limit, right? So the n grows and becomes larger and larger. So this would be the edge in this case, right? Of course, the behavior could be a little different here than exactly where I touch the boundaries. There are different geometric situations, and this is something I will come back to. So this would be the edge then. So if I change some parameter in the model, so now I give different weights here to different, or the two, sort of you have kind of horizontal and vertical dominance if you turn your head 45 degrees, you give them somewhat different weights, then you see that the macroscopic shape changes here. But you would still, I could still expect that the fluctuations of these boundaries would be the same in both cases. So this is what I mean by so the universality, yeah? What's the colors? Well, the colors, I will explain it maybe a little. The color, they're, they're sort of, there is a <coughs> bipartite, a black and white coloring behind this, and depending on how 
how the a vertical domino can cover in two ways, and this gives two colors, and the horizontal can cover in two ways. So this gives the color. Other questions? So there are many other, pe you can do different models. This is the model I will talk more about in the second lecture here. So this is also an Aztec diamond, but with a different weighting, which I will come back to, called the two periodic weights. And here you also see some shape emerging, right? But there also seems to be some other shape here. You see, there are different types of regions here. So we could also try to understand what, what, what are sort of, there could be some kind of edge fluctuations here also. So the limit shapes then would be some, as I said, some deterministic objects. I will, the liquid, solid, gas, I will explain later what, what that means in this context. So these are the non-random limit curves. And what we're interested in are sort of the fluctuations. I mean, if we go back here, the, these, there would be some fluctuations here around this, this limit shape, right? So just as we saw in the central limit theory. So you, of course, this could again be a normal distribution, but it turns out that it's not, and that there is a very rich theory around what, what the edge, statistical edge behavior is in these models. So there are many different models here. Here's another example where we instead have rhombi or lozenges and tile this hexagonal region. And if you turn your head slightly here now, you can see that this also looks like cubes stacked in a corner, right? You can see these cubes, they're, they're sort of, there's a bottom face here and there are some cubes here and I build up this surface, right? So there's also a kind of random surface shape here. And this is true also for this Aztec diamond, that there's this kind of height representation. I will come back to this in the case of, around, of the Aztec diamond later, which is sort of is the prototypical example here now. So, so here, here, you see, there's also kind of limit, seems to be some limit shape of this surface here. So the edge now would be when this curved surface here hits this flat boundary. So you could imagine this as some kind of crystal where you have these facets and you have some rough part of the crystal and this rough part meets this, this facet here. So this is an important and representation also of these models as a kind of random surface. So you could also ask what, what, what are the fluctuations of this random surface itself? That's another type of question which I will not discuss. So this is not what I would call edge fluctuations in this talk. Also, this is of course also fluctuations about the limit shape, but I'm interested sort of in this type of boundaries that you see here. So, this type of models, these random tiling models, are closely related in many ways with the with so-called local random growth models that have been much studied recently. So this is actually an experimental realization of these kind of things by Takeuchi and Sano. So you have this growing region here. So here you also see you get some kind of limit shape, but the, the, the edge is sort of rough here. And you can again ask for the fluctuations as this grows of this edge here, and also what this sort of random looking curve, what the statistics of this is. And this turns out to be the same, actually, as in these random tiling models. So, so in this context, one talks about the Cardal Parisi Shang universality class, then, for this sort of, one notices that there, the fluctuations seem to be universal in a rather wide class of models here, these local random growth models. So I will not, in this talk, discuss these local random growth models, but that's sort of a closely related type of problem here. So as I said, we want to understand these edge scaling limits. Then. So you can, and we expect them to be universal from this sort of very vague, of course, argument that I had in the beginning here. So typical questions, then, which lim limits can we actually get here? I mean, there would, we had these boundaries, right? There could be some, bound, some limit there, but we also had points where we sort of touched the boundary, right? Which could lead to other limits. And as we will see later on, there are also other geometric situations which leads to new limits. So, 
we want to sort of explore what are the Gaussians here. I mean, we, I mean in the central limit theorem, that's the theorem that it converges, but there is also some formula for the limit. Right? We can describe what the limit is. Um, so we want, to have, we want to know what are the natural limits that we can get within this class of models that would be these sort of universal limit processes. Then. So we, so we want to sort of compute these limits and show that they occur at least in some specific models. And then, of course, this question, whether it really is universal and we can prove this in some, this is a, a question that goes much further, where much less is known. So the underlying structure here in many of these models and in describing the limits here is a class of point processes called determinantal point processes. But recent work also goes beyond this. I mean, so some of these things I'm talking about also have interesting extensions beyond this de determinantal processes, but although the limits tend to still be described by this, this limiting determinantal processes. So this is a huge development recently, which I will also, also connect with random growth, which I will not cover here. I just want to point that th this is sort of, because this is current developments in mathematics, this is a big current development of extending lots of these results beyond the sort of determinantal structure in, in, for the sort of finite model. So here's an outline of the, of the talks here. So I will say a little about determinantal point process, just so that you know what they are to some extent. And I will, these models, tiling models, are also so-called so dimer models on bipartite graphs. They can also be described by non-intersecting paths, and I want to sort of have both these pictures. And then I will sort of just go through and list some of these scaling limits that you can get. I mean, I will not really discuss how you do with the asymptotics. The second talk, I will sort of concentrate on these two periodic Aztec diamond and go a little more into the detail and discuss this model, and then also short discussion about universality at the end. So, any questions so far? Okay, so let's start with very brief introduction to determinantal point processes. So let X be some space here. You can think of the real line, the integer, so some finite set. And we have some reference measure on this set. So, I mean, if we have R, we would typically have the bag measure. On a finite set, we would have counting measure as our reference measure. And we have some point process on this space X. So some random set of points where xi belongs to the set x. So this could be finite or it could be infinite. So how do you characterize a random point process? Well, what you can do is that you, you take some positive function with compact support on this space. Continuous, say, where we think this could be, say, a metric space or locally compact space or something like that. We take some function psi and we sample the points with this function and sum over all the points. So you can imagine if we know the distribution of all these sums for all choices of psi, then we have a description of the process. We can count the number of points, say, in different intervals or approximations of that. So we look at the Laplace transform of all these random variables. So if you replace this sum here with a product and write this as 1 minus 1 minus this, it's just the same thing, and we can call this phi. So this is still some compactly supported function here. So we really want to understand the expectation of some product of this form, where phi is between 0 and 1. So, so what can you do? Well, you can expand the product, right? And then when you expand the product, you have to integrate this against something. So say that this something that you have to integrate against has some density with respect to this reference measure that we have. Then these functions that you get here in this expansion are called the correlation functions of this point process. So if they exist, for, you know them from all n, then you, you know sort of what the point process is. So one way of describing a point process is to give all these correlation functions. And if you think this, this 
computation through if you have a discrete model, so say that you're on a finite set or C or something like that, then this rho n is just the probability of finding particles at x1 up to xn. Otherwise, it's sort of a density then of particles or n tuples of particles. So not a probability density, but a density. But we're thinking mostly of discrete models now, so you can think of this as the probability of finding particles at these points. So determinantal point processes is a special class of point processes then, where these correlation functions are given by a determinant with a certain function of two variable k here. So determinant of k, x, i, x, j here, where i and j go between 1 and n then, where if we have these n particles. Then. So it's an n by n determinant. Then. So this function k of x is called the correlation kernel. Right? So So that if I give you the correlation kernel, then this describes the whole process. So the process is given in terms of the, of the correlation kernel. So this is an interesting subclass of, the, of point processes. So an example of a computation here that is typical here for determinantal processes is that, okay, we had this, we had this expectation of this product now we've replaced the correlation function had this form. So if you've seen the Fredholm expansion of a Fredholm determinant, you may recognize this type of object. Right? So for example, if I let phi of x be the indicator function and x is greater than psi here, and I insert this into this formula, then of course each, of, each factor here will be zero unless xi is less than or equal to psi. Right? So, the product then will be the indicator that all particles are less than or equal to psi here. So by this formula then, we see that this is given by this expansion here, which is just the expansion of this Fredholm determinant. So Fredholm determinants feature prominently in, in the theory of determinant processes. These type of probabilities are given by Fredholm determinants. So the importance of this determinantal processes now in, the, in this class of random tiling models or dimer models that we talk about is that they are determinantal point processes. So, so what we need then is some formulas for these correlation kernels. I mean, the determinantal point process is given by this correlation kernel. Right? So we want some formula for this, but as I said, we're interested in scaling limits here. So we actually Want, we want to have a useful formula, right? something which we can use to compute asymptotic from. Right? So the scaling limits will be given by, by limiting correlation kernel. Right? So, so I will, the, the scaling limits that we see in these pictures when we zoom in at these boundaries will be given by certain correlation kernels. So the question is, what kind of natural limiting correlation kernels can we get? So l let me start now by, by looking at these dimer models. Then. So here is this Aztec diamond shape. So this model was introduced more than 20 years ago by Elkis, Cooperberg, Larson, and Prop. So it's, a, it's a sort of a very nice basic model in this framework somehow. So uh, the pictures have been sort of turned here now. So, so this, this blue thing is, is sort of something covering there, which would be sort of horizontal domino. Something covering there would be this vertical domino. Here it's two colors, but you can imagine that I had sort of, I do a checkerboard coloring of this, of this region also, sort of black, white, black, white, and so on, right? And then these two can cover in different ways. And this gives these colors that I, you saw in the previous pictures. And I can also give different weights, say, to the, to the blue and the vertical, blue and the red dominoes here, the horizontal and, and ver vertical dominoes, right? So, so, so this, and this you saw when I changed the parameter, this would change the shape of the picture here now. But you can also think of this as a dimer model. So, so you, you, you look at sort of the dual 
graph of what you, the, the graph that you see here. So then you, you sort of have vertices at these, in these squares here, and these dominoes corresponds to covering every vertex exactly once, right, by these so-called dimers. Then. So if we, look, so there is this underlying graph where you have this sort of black and white coloring structure, so it's a bipartite graph. And you have to cover it. So here you cover this with this domino here, or this dimer, as we say now, right? And you cover this one, this one. So, so all dimer coverings of this graph here corresponds directly to, the cover, to these domino tilings. So it's a special type of so-called dimer model on this sort of Aztec diamond graph here. So we, as I said, we could have different weights here. No? So more generally, we can, to each, to all, each edge in this graph, we can asso assign some weight, I mean, say some positive weight. And then the probability of a certain dimer configuration would be the probability, the product of all the weights which are, of the dimers which are covered. Then, right? And then I normalize this by some constant capital C here, which is the so-called partition function in this statistical mechanical model. And since this is the bipartite graph now, I mean, you see, you have to, oh, sorry, you have to, if I have the black vertices B1 to Bn, say, and the white vertices W1 to Wn, then a dimer goes from some black vertex to some white vertex. Right. So if this is vertex i, it goes to vertex sigma i. I mean, there's some numbering here. That's, I choose some numbering of the black and white vertices. Of course, not all permutations will occur. I mean, since, I mean, they have to be adjacent, right, to covers. I mean, so only some of these will actually receive some weight here. But I can, if the partition function, then I get by summing over all, parti all the permutations of the weights where I connect B i to W sigma i here. This you can recognize as a permanent. So it's like a determinant, but I don't have the sign factor here. Right? But permanents are not so easy to work with. So it's much better to have a determinant. So this is the basic idea, which goes back to Castellane then, is to turn this into a, a, a determinant by adding some signs to these weights here. So we have something which we can call the Castellane sign. So to each edge, I don't just have this weight, I also have a sign which could be plus or minus one or maybe the imaginary unit or something like that. And this has to satisfy certain properties, which I will not discuss now for this to work. Then. So then I define the Castellane matrix as the matrix indexed by the black vertices and the white vertices, where I have this weight, but I also have this sign. So for example, for the Aztec diamond, this choice works then. That I take, if, if this is a horizontal, edge, then I just take the weight. If it's vertical, I multiply by square root of minus one. here, And everything else is, is zero, of course, because it cannot be connected, right? So then the theorem of Castellane is that if I choose signs in, a, in the right way, and this can be done, it's not so hard for an explicit graph to check this, then the partition function, or the partition function is given by the determinant of this up to some sign, which is independent of the weights, but depends on the choice here of, of the signs and the ordering of things like that. And from this, you can derive the following result, which goes back to Montreal, Potts, and Ward, in the 60s, when Castellane was also working on this, but it's mathematically often called Kenyon's theorem. So if I take some specific edges, say E1 up to EM here, and I ask what's the probability that these edges belong to a dimer covering? So I have some covering, what's the probability that all these given dimers are actually part of the covering? Well, this will be given by the inverse of this Castellane matrix multiplied here by, so Wi 
bj here multiplied by the Kessler matrix element bi wa. So if you remember now what we said about determinantal processes, this means that these dimers actually form a determinantal process, right? Because if I take the kernel here to be just this product then of the inverse with this element here, then this will actually be a determinantal process. I should maybe have written B, I, J, and sorry, it's not quite correct it's written there, but you see what I mean. This is the kernel then, this thing here of this determinantal process. So all these models are determinantal processes when I have diamond models on bipartite graphs. Of course, computing an inverse of the, of the large thing like this is not feasible in general, right? This is a very complicated problem. So although I know it's a determinantal process, this doesn't mean that I really can do anything with this. This is what I mean, that, that I, mean, I need a useful formula. I need something where I can actually compute limits. So I, I will come back for the, to, to using this, this framework later for this two periodic Aztec diamond that I mentioned in the beginning. But first I want to sort of look at another way of looking at, say, this Aztec diamond but which can be generalized to other models also, is that I describe this instead of thinking of dimers, I think in terms of these non-intersecting paths. So I can draw these paths. I start at these blue points here. And then I go from a blue to a red point. So I cross this domino this way, see? And here, and then I continue like this, and I go up again. I reach this domino, I go down, and I go down again, and I end at this point. So you can, and you, you see it's clear how that you have to go a certain way here. So these dominoes here will not be, have anything on them, but all the other three, and this is these four types again that we were seeing, these four colors. And I added some fixed dominoes there in the lower corner also. So I go from blue to red, and then from red to blue, but they can coincide, but if I split them, the red and the blue, I get this picture here. So this is just another representation of this, di of this domino tiling here, right? in terms of these paths instead. And if I just shift these paths a little, I can get this picture. So you see, I go from these fixed initial points to some fixed final points. And I give, if, I give, if, you, if you see this path, then you can just go back to this picture and then go back to this. So there is, this is a bijection between, between these paths, oh, sorry, between the paths of this form. So I alternate, by, here I can go step up or just straight ahead. Here I go straight ahead, but I can also go straight ahead and then down like this. There are two types of steps here. So, so and I can put in some, the weights that we had A and 1, say, for these two types of dominoes, vertical and horizontal, they move into this, this picture also. So I, I can translate the whole problem into these non-intersecting paths instead. So, so this means that instead of thinking of the dominoes, I can think of this particle system here. Right? So these particles is another way of thinking of this random tiling. And this is also a determinantal process. So I will not prove that, but I will sort of indicate the steps, some of the steps that lead to this. So, so going sort of from one column here to the next column, you see there are certain transitions. I can, in some steps, I can go, I, I can, as I said, go straight ahead, or I go straight ahead and then down, and I have these weights here. So these are these steps here. But, and also I have these steps where I can go up or stay the same. So I have some transition weights between columns here. Between, for, for one path here, I can go using these weights here. So these points here, they actually form a point process. And since this is a random configuration here. So if I look at the whole picture, now, th then it's a theorem by Lindstrom, Gessel, and Vienno that if I have this transition weight, but I condition that these paths should not intersect. Because, I mean, you recall that these paths initially are sitting on this, on this picture, right? so they cannot cross, right? 
So the only possible paths that I can have here are non-intersecting ones. So I want to count the weight of all non-intersecting paths here. And this I can do by taking determinants connecting these points. These are the coordinates of the points in the different columns and, and taking this determinant. This gives the way to do, take one step here but without intersection. And the product of all this is then the weight for the whole non-intersecting path pictures. And then I have to normalize again to get a probability then. So th this is a representation of the sort of measure describing this point process here now. And now it's a theorem that if you have a measure of this form, then this always defines a determinantal point process. So this, I will not discuss this here. We have to accept this as a fact. So this, this is a computation with determinants. It's, it's, just, it's a computation going back to the definition I had of, of what I mean by a determinantal point process. But more than that, you can actually also give a formula for the correlation kernel. So there is this formula for the correlation kernel in this case. And what comes into this formula, so this PRSUV, this is the transition weight from column R to column S now. So I mean, I go from one column to some column farther away. This will also be given by a determinant. But, uh, but I mean, if I look at just going from point X to Y with sort of one path, then this is the transition weight for this. And this matrix A, which I have to invert here, this is the matrix of all transition from the fixed starting points to the fixed final points. Recall from the picture that the, these points and these points are fixed at these positions. So what I have here is, is then a tuplets determinant, because this only depends on the differences of this, as is easy to see if you think about the picture. So this, uh, so it only depends on the differences here, and this is are the Fourier coefficients of this function. This is something you just work out from these transition functions that I had here now. So the, the matrix that you have to invert here is this tuplet matrix. Now we're lucky, very lucky in this case in the following way. If you, you, you can imagine that I can, if I add more paths here, so I start at sort of minus three and go to minus three, this will have to be a straight path. There is no way of going up because I will be stopped by these other paths due to the non-intersection condition. So I can sort of add infinitely many straight lines there, which means that I can take the number of paths here, capital M, to infinity here, which is very good because it's easier to invert an infinite tuplets determinant than a finite one. So there is a theory for that, which I will not describe, be based on Wiener Hopf factorization of, of this symbol that we have. So using this, you can actually rewrite this as a contour integral formula where these are some specific functions, rational functions in this case of the Aztec diamond. So, you, you, so now we have a formula which is, doesn't contain this inverse, some complicated thing, but is something that we can actually work with. So I describe this now in the case of the, of the Aztec diamond, but the theory is, is broader here. This is an example of a so-called Schur process, which was introduced by Okunkov and Reshetik, and it's called a Schur process because these determinants that I have by the so-called Jacobi-Trudy formula, they are actually so-called Schur functions or Schur polynomials in this case. So this product of determinants is a product of these Schur polynomials, and you can use lots of fact about Schur polynomials also to work with this. I mean, so, so hence the name here. So here we have what, what I sort of, what we can call now a useful formula in this context. So, and it, this type of Schur process occur also in many other examples. I mean, so this is what I discussed now. We can, you can look at random skew plane partitions there are also these local random growth models that I mentioned briefly, which fit into this 
picture in certain cases on some lost passage percolation models also. So this is a rather rich class of determinantal processes which comes sort of from this kind of non-intersecting path models. So let me now come to sort of the scaling limits. So let me draw just a schematic thing here. So, for, for, so what, what you, we have this sort of Aztec diamond shape, right? And that, then we had some, some picture like this, which in the limit should be, go to a circle. So now you can, I could zoom in somewhere here, say. This would be sort of a typical point that I look at sort of the, the bound, in the curve that I see that bounds to this regular tile region that I have. I could also some zoom in here, say, it would, be, it would be a more special situation. So these two cases are, are rather different. So there are basically two situations here where when I zoom in at a point like this, I have to rescale sort of continuously in both directions. So there is one direction here, sort of, in one direction here, and I have to rescale to continuous variables in both directions. Whereas when I look at this case, it's, I actually sort of keep it discrete in this direction, but continuous in the other direction. So there are different types of scaling limits that you can do here. So, so what I mean by a scaling limit then is we have this kernel here, right? And then the variables I have in the kernel I do some rescaling like this with some exponents. So n is, th this is the size of this Aztec diamond here. Right? So gamma and delta are some exponents. Rho i and xi are the new continuous variables here. Alpha and beta are some constants, right, which you have to compute. C and n, or C and d here, are the, what describes the macroscopic shape. Right? I have to zoom in. I want to zoom in at the boundaries. I want to really zoom in at this point. So the choice of C and D determines that I'm at the boundary, right? So a scaling limit would be something like this. I might have to modify this kernel by what's called a conjugation. You see, if you look at this whole expression, this is again a correlation kernel because the correlation kernels always go into a determinant. So if you have some quotient like this, where the numerator depends only on half of the variables and the denominator on the other two here, then this goes away in the determinant here. So this doesn't really, the, the correlation kernel is not unique. And you may have to modify it in this way when you take the limit. And then I, this factor that I had here, I multiply by also. Then this should have some scaling limit, which then describes what I see in the limit. Somehow. So the limit should be, again, be a new point process, which is given by this kernel here. I could also, as I had, which is the case at this point here, that I keep one of the variables discrete and only do a continuous rescaling in the other variable. Right? Then I end up with this situation. And typical exponents here in this, in this sort of, in this basic situation where I look at the boundary here would be what's called the KPC scaling exponents, which are delta one-third here. So this is one-third and this gamma is two-third here. But depending on the geometric situation, these exponents can vary. So, so let's just walk through these, these the cases that you can get here. So, this is the typical edge behavior. This is what I, when you zoom in at this, around the boundary that we saw in this picture here. This is what you would see in this local random growth model. So the limiting kernel that you get has this form. You don't have to sort of, if you haven't seen this before, it looks strange, you just accept that there is some formula for the limiting kernel, which is called the extended area kernel in this case here. It contains the area function, hence the name. If, if rho one is equal to rho two, I get what's called the area kernel. Right? 
So the picture you should think of is something like this, that I've scaled continuously in this direction and in this direction. So this, this, this corresponds to this, what I see here. Right? So there are sort of several, actually several lines here. So this is this outer line here. And then there's the second line and the third line here. And if you, in, in the limit, this will go to some continuous curve. This is called the airy line ensemble. And the boundary that you see in the picture should be in the limit given by this top curve. And what this kernel describes then is that I intersect this at some points, tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4, and so on, some finite number of points. This will intersect these curves at these red points. And these red points, they, also, they are form a determinantal point process. And the kernel for this determinantal process is this extended area kernel. Right? So row 1 and row 2 would belong to the set tau 1 to tau m. Psi 1 and psi 2 are some real number. Right? And of course, I can vary tau 1 and tau 2 and tau 3 and then sort of figure out where, where these curves are. So, the basic, the most interesting thing is then this, is the, this top curve. And this top curve in the limit is what's called the airy process then. It's a stationary process, tau to a tau here, which has continuous paths. Locally, it looks like Brownian motion, but it's not a Markov process. Right? And the probability that this top curve then stays below certain points this is this kind of probability that I we looked a little at the beginning, that you're below a certain points everywhere. This is given by a Fredholm determinant. So you can characterize this area process by a Fredholm determinant. And if I just look at one line and the top point there, how this fluctuates, this is given by a single determinant with this area kernel. This is the so-called Tracy Widom distribution, which has now become quite well known and also occurs in random matrix theory. So this is the la largest eigenvalue distribution that you see for large Hermitian matrices. So this is something I haven't emphasized here, but there's, these determinantal processes are also natural limits in her the theory of large Hermitian random matrices. So there is a, re some relation there, although I mean there are no random matrices in these models. I mean, I cannot write down a random matrix which captures this behavior here, but the same type of limits occur as in random matrix theory. And also in this, in this random growth model. So this area process is a basic limiting process that you see in these models. So just to show you more specifically what I meant in mean, this picture here, you can, if I, you can see, I, I can draw this bound, discrete boundary curve here now between this regular region here and this more disordered region here. So there is a well-defined curve here. When I first go from having this, I leave this regular brick pattern here, and I see something different. The first time I see this is this top curve. So this is the top curve among these non-intersecting paths that you saw before, right? which should then convert to the top curve in this area kernel point process description that in the previous picture. And this is indeed the case then. So if you rescale this with these KPC exponents, this just subtract the limiting position by right, this circle then, right? This is this thing here. This converges to the area process minus a parabola because this will bend down. So this is a typical example of a limit theorem that you want to have in this type of models, that you have this specific model and it converges to this sort of universal limit process. But as I said, this is, this is the, the sort of a typical situation, but you can have other situa geometric situations also, which are more special than. So a, a special situation is illustrated in this picture. So this is a different type of model called a random skew planar partition. This is what Okunko Vareshitikin studied and they introduced this Schul process. So I will not, you, you, you sort of have these walls here 
and you have sort of like these cubes stacked in this corner again. So I, let me not define the model precisely, but you can see these curves here should again converge to this area process. And similarly for this curve, but these curves can sort of meet at this point, which in the limit shape would be a cusp. And if you zoom in then exactly at this cusp, you would expect to see something different, right? You will not get the area process again. You sort of you have these sort of two merging area processes. Right? So if you zoom in exactly at this point, you get a different limiting kernel, and which is called the Piercy kernel. So don't worry about the details. Again, again, you zoom in, you have to choose different exponents here than the KPC ones in this case. And you get this formula here for the limiting kernel, right? which would then describe the sort of the point process structure close to this cusp. Then. Yet another situation you can see in this picture, which are sort of two overlapping Aztec diamonds here. So remember, we could have these Aztec diamonds with these elliptical limit shapes. So here you sort of have two of these, which are sort of tangent here. So again, here you we should have the area process, and similar on the other side. But they sort of meet here and touch each other. So in the limit, you would have two ellipses which are tangent to each other. So this is so-called tech node situation. And you can again compute what's happening exactly at this point of tangency here. There's a new sort of limiting process that you can see here, which is given by so-called tack node kernel, which I won't write down. It's fairly complicated, but it can be worked out. So here we actually leave this Schul process framework. So this is more complicated because if you look into the formulas that I had, here you end up that you have to invert a finite tuplets matrix instead. You cannot take this limit to an infinite tuplets matrix. So this makes this situation more complicated. I also said that you could have this discrete continuum limit. So you keep one variable discrete here. So let me discuss just this situation here now. So recall that we had this, when we had these non-intersecting paths, I had these sort of blue and red points. So actually, there was this, this red point and this blue point were sitting at this position. Then. But I can shift them to the side so they sit on the dominoes or at the vertices in this Aztec diamond graph that we have. So if you look at the blue points here, they have this sort of interlacing structure, one, two, three here. So let's keep just the blue points and look at a large picture. So the, then you sort of have one, and then you have two, and you have three. If you would go sort of one step, it's a little hard to see. If you go once, maybe it's even clearer here. You have one, then you have two, you have three, and so on for the holes there, right? So you can zoom in at this point here, which is exactly this point of tangency there, and see what kind of behavior you have for these interlacing particles at this point. Then. So if, if I look here again, you should see the area process. But when the area process, when you approach this point of tangency with the boundary here, you get something different. And the right limit is this discrete continuum limit. So if I zoom in there, you get what's called the GUE minor or corners kernel instead, which can be expressed in terms of Hermit polynomials. So this is yet another sort of special geometric situation here. And there are more situations. There are two more. I will just mention them briefly here to just to you see the collection of things that are known in this type of models. Now, you can have a special cusp situation also, where you have actually two different type of tiles going into the cusp. This was not the case in the previous picture. So here the right thing is also to keep it discrete in the direction orthogonal to the cusp here, and continuum scaling in this direction along the cusp. Actually, this point here fluctuates like a tracy widom distribution, which is not the case in the Pierce. So here there is a new kernel called the cusp area kernel, which you can also compute. So this is yet another special situation. Here. The most special, and but also as I will say in the last slides for this first part, then is, is this situation. You have sort of this type of 
recall we had this sort of GUE corner or minor process here where you sort of had discrete things. So you could have two of these m meeting like this. So you have these, these sort of belong to the left aspect and this to the right aspect, and they have a certain interlacing structure here where they meet. So you can zoom in exactly at that point also and compute yet another rather complicated kernel called the discrete tack node kernel. And in very recent ongoing work, we are looking with Mark Adler here and Pierre van Merbecke on more general version of these sort of doubly interlacing systems, which is something you can get in these models. So as you see, there is this sort of soon now different geometric situations which you can look at. So if, I, if you look at this picture here now, this is sort of the typical situation which describes the, the, what you had along the boundary related to the area process. As I go up here, I have more special geometric situations. So the TAC node is more general than the PSU. You can get the PSU kernel as a limit of the TAC node kernel. The most general one, which is not really completely worked out yet, but we, we have a candidate for it, is this discrete techno, which should sort of be the top one in this hierarchy here. These red things are sort of things that you see actually in the bulk. The bulk is, has less structure and is, is sort of lowest in some sense here, which you can get from the edge behavior. You can sort of move in from the edge into the bulk, but of course you cannot do the other, go the other way. I mean, the bulk doesn't tell you anything about the edge, right? So, so there is this sort of slew of possibilities here for, for this limiting behavior in terms of different limiting kernels. Right? So any sort of, so the universality problem then is to somehow understand that these are the universal kernels, right? That I, did, I showed the indicator that these do occur in certain specific models. But in the all similar geometric situations, you should get these limits, right? So whenever you have a TAC node, you should have the same limit here in, in some broad class of models. Right? So th this is sort of the, what I meant when I want to understand the possible limits. I've not said anything about universality. We know that some of these occur in, in different models, but still only a very specific example. So I think I'll stop here for the first talk. You mean for the simulations here? Yes, yeah, yeah. There are there are sort of. Well, I, I, I won't, there is a certain. I mean, it goes back to something called the shuffling algorithm, which was developed. So there is sort of an exact simulation algorithm for this. If you take just the Aztec diamond, you can generate it successively larger Aztec diamonds with an exact sampling algorithm. So, so there, there are ways of sort of actually. From, say, from a distribution here to exactly sample a large one like this. So th th this is sort of, it's a good question, and it's, I should say that it's been really, it's an important aspect that you can actually do this. I mean, that because it, it's sort of, I mean, we don't really use any computers when doing the math here, but to understand what can happen, these pictures have been very important. I mean, so it shows the influence, I think, of simulations in, in finding out what can happen. I don't think, I don't know of any. You could imagine that you could maybe construct one by sort of having some coupled matrices and adding some kind of, um, of restrictions, I mean, some extra conditioning or something like that, but I don't know. You can, you can get this from non-intersecting Brownian motions. You start with a continuum model, so you have sort of Brownian motions going between two points like this, and some other Brownian motions going by from two points like this, and they sort of touch in some region here. 
So you could try to, by doing some kind of conditioning in, in, a, in a matrix model, you could presumably do this, but I don't, I don't think it has been done. I don't know if there is sort of a natural setting for it somehow. We, there is for the PRC, but not really for the 